and welcome to my June reading wrap up. I read 10 books in the month of June. This is my stack. There are only nine here. I read one ebook from the library as well. In terms of basic quick little stats that I have, I read 10 books total. Six were from my shelves unread. Three were from the library and one was a book that I borrowed. So I also bought zero books or acquired zero in the month of June. So that's just six books off of my unread TBR, which I'm happy with. But I do have 10 things to talk about and I don't want this to be like an hour and a half long video. So let's just get into them. Overall, pretty good reading month. I read a variety and like a lot of different things. Um, all the way from like books I didn't rate into books that I gave five stars. So. I, I'm quite pleased. The first book that I read in June was Ready Player One and to be honest I should say this was the first book that I finished in June because I started buddy reading this with Flora from Crazy Book Lady like two years ago and I read like two-thirds of the book and then put it down and never came back to it. So my thoughts on this not great, not super eloquent, don't really remember the first two thirds very much, but I wasn't enjoying it so I didn't want to go back. Keep that in mind when it comes to my thoughts. Um, this is, I think, YA, YA dystopian fiction about a boy who lives in a future world in which virtual reality is kind of how you get through the day. Like the actual world is pretty terrible virtual reality makes it worth living and the man who created this virtual reality world died and in his will he said that whoever can like follow the little clues and the scavenger hunt that he made will win the full like legal rights to this world because he owns it um so basically the main character tries to follow the scavenger hunt and like it's been years no one's done it and then all of a sudden he finds the first clue. I gave this two stars. <laughs> Not a fan. Not a fan. For me, and again, these are my thoughts on mostly the final third because the first two thirds, a little bit vague. I found the 80s references very boring. It was like they existed to be references to remind you that these things existed instead of having any actual meaning in the story like you can reference things and have it be like important meaningful like say something about the characters or the world or whatever but in this book it was so much it was so frequent and it was mostly just like hey look remember that 80s thing that 80s thing existed and it's like why are you telling me this because it existed and I found that very annoying I also found the way he treated his love interest in the book kind of like cringy I struggled with it a lot like he tended to disregard a lot of her wishes and sort of did things his way and did what he wanted and then in the book it was kind of like oh well this turned out to be the right thing all along and I mean like personal things not like relating to the scavenger hunt or anything but just like she would talk about like not wanting to share any pictures of herself or like not wanting him to see what she looked like and he sort of disregarded that completely in the book it was very much treated as well, this is okay, even though she was so uncomfortable with it and repeatedly told him not to. And I'm sure I had other issues as well. I was not enjoying this when I read it two years ago. And had I had I been enjoying it, I would have just reread it from the beginning. But like, I was already so close. I just wanted to finish it off. So I did. It's off my TBR. I'm pleased to be done with it. I know this has a lot of love on booktube, but I did not get very much out of it. Then I read Postmortem by Patricia Cornwell. This is the first book in the Kate Scarpetta series. This is a crime fiction novel centered around, centered, who is she? The medical examiner. Um, and they're investigating a serial killer. I am particularly interested in this series because it's set in the same city that I live in. So like, to me, that's really cool to just like, recognize the area, recognize the schools that she mentions, like even to a degree some of the restaurants are just like the areas. I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the book and I do plan on reading more Patricia Cornwell books. However, this one I was not impressed with. I gave it two stars. It is her first, 
ever novel. It's her debut and it's from the early 90s. So keep that in mind with this review. I'm sure she's gotten better. But essentially the medical examiner and the police department are just investigating the serial killer who is raping and strangling women. The things I struggled with in this book. Um, first of all, this is based well. She says it's not based on anything, but it's clearly based on a real serial killer who was active in Richmond, Virginia, where this is set and where I live in around the same time. Um, the serial killer was like a few years before this book was published. Um, he was late 80s, this book is early 90s. So it was a little bit of a struggle for me in that regard, especially because like it is so very obviously pulled from that case like one of the victims in this book is exactly the same as one of the victims who was killed when he was active and i mean like the only thing that was changed was her name basically like she had the same job she lived in the same area she was killed in the same way she had the same like details about her her husband was away because he worked out of town and was gone for the week just like in real life and for me that was kind of a struggle like I didn't mind so much that this was based or inspired by a real serial killer but it seems so unnecessary to draw so many small details from a victim and basically write the victim into the story in a way that was wholly unnecessary and like didn't matter to the overall plot of the story like she could have been a completely different person like none of these victims none of these the details needed to match the real person in order for this book to work like it didn't contribute anything she could have been anyone and instead Cornwall chose to make her this victim and that made me really really uncomfortable again if you don't recognize the case you're not going to notice that but I read a book about the case a few years back and it's it's very very obvious despite that I was kind of ready to give this book three stars until the end because it was kind of like okay like it wasn't very good but it also wasn't very bad once you get into it it's kind of just like the case is unfolding and if you can like kind of get past the fact that this book is 30 years old at this point and like it's not always like kind of up to speed with where we are today in terms of the way we treat people especially women um if you can get past that it is okay until you get to the end and basically one of the big plot points of this case hinges on the fact that in the words of the main character one of the victims is a black woman who talks white she sounds white um again according to the main character and this is a conversation she has and kind of like the climax of the book hinges on that which was just like ooh, racist um you know and this wasn't just like a passing thing like the climax of the book hinged upon that realization so um yeah that was kind of the point where I was like I'm not giving this book the benefit of the doubt anymore this is two stars I didn't really enjoy it one of the characters like not the serial killer one of the main characters in this book is also a literal rapist and like nothing is really done with that it's kind of just like oh he's a rapist and then like disregarded nothing happens there's no like consequences and I don't necessarily mean legally I mean like in the way the characters treat him it's just kind of like there's that moment of like oh he's a rapist and then we all moved on and never discussed it again which is weird um I, I didn't like this one I wouldn't recommend this one but I do want to read more Patricia Cornwell books and more books in the series um potentially something a little bit later because I do think starting with an author's debut when they've had you know however many books I assume she's got well over 20 maybe over 30. Um, it, I think it's kind of unfair to judge like her whole career by her first book so I do want to read more I would love to like be super into a series that's set where I live because like that's cool to me um, this one just like kind of wasn't it for me. Then I read Committing Journalism The Prison Writings of Red Hog by Danny and Martin and Peter Y. Sussman this I almost did a full review on and I was like no one no one cares <laughs> no one cares except for me this is a book about journalism 
written by Danny Martin and Peter Sussman. Danny Martin was a bank robber and kind of just in general a career criminal. He spent most of his life in jail I think at the at the during the time they were talking about he was like in his mid to late 40s and had spent like 21 of the years of his life either like in prison or in some kind of like youth facility and he was also a heroin addict for a good portion of his life and just in general criminal you know in every sort of sense of the word and he was in prison doing like a 20 year stint for bank robbery and he started reading books and he started kind of getting interested in writing and so he started writing articles about prison and just sent them to newspapers and Peter Sussman was an editor at I think the San Francisco Chronicle and he received one of these submissions and was like this is good writing this seems interesting it's interesting to put in the paper so he did and their relationship went from there and he started publishing more of Danny Martin's works and essentially the prison system decided that Danny Martin was being a little too critical of him, of them. So they put him in solitary confinement. They moved him to like several different facilities and cut off like his contact with the outside world, with his editor and like banned him from writing. And there was a big first amendment case about it. And this book contains some of his writings, but is also just like a lot of outside context of like how he became a writer. Um, what was going on in the First Amendment case, what was going on in his writing, like background details to some of the articles he was writing. It's really interesting. It covers like the entire time he was in prison and or well, the entire time he was writing in prison and then a little bit after. So long spiel, but I feel like that's needed to really understand what this book is about. Fascinating. I gave this five stars. I love this so much. I was kind of thinking like this was going to be like a solid four stars, like really enjoyable. But the longer I read it, the more I was just like, I adore every second that I'm reading this book. This is fantastic. This is like everything I want, you know, like I love reading about journalism. I love reading journalism and just like kind of the discussion of journalism itself, I think is all really well done in this book. Um, it's fascinating. Like <laughs> if it sounds interesting to you, you will love this. Um, it is mostly like mostly like focused on the journalism itself and then kind of there is some like background discussion of prison reform which again out of date because this book takes place mostly during the late 80s and then was published in the early 90s <laughs> so don't don't go to this for anything recent but like a lot of the discussions on prison reform are still very relevant today <laughs> uh. So that was interesting. And then there was also the First Amendment case. So there was discussion on like First Amendment rights and the rights of prisoners behind bars. Very interesting. Um, they wound up losing the case, which is like, <laughs> wasn't expecting that because I'd not heard of this. This was before my time, you know, I'd not been born yet, but it was just really interesting. The only flaw that I really had in this book was like how little the actual legal case was discussed Peter Sussman kind of like, it talks about it in vague and talks about like what's happening to Danny Martin during the First Amendment trial. But the trial itself, he kind of just brushes it off as like, oh, a bunch of lawyers discussing like constitutional theory and then like doesn't discuss it in depth. And I do wish, I do wish he discussed the trial more and the law case more because that would have just been like the icing on top of the cake. But this book was wonderful for what it was. I loved it so much. Like, I could see myself rereading this in a few years. I don't know who to recommend this to because, like, it's very niche. <laughs> it really is, but it was so fantastic. Like, if you're interested in journalism or even, like, prison reform to a degree or First Amendment to a degree, but I think mainly journalism, I recommend picking this up because it was wonderful. It was so wonderful. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite books of the year so far. I don't give many things five stars, but this, this was deservedly five stars. Then I read Sort of Destiny by Andrei Sapkowski and we're back to the two stars. Um, lots of two stars this month. That's okay. I'll read anything if I get a five star in there. This is the second book in the Witcher series. It is a collection of short stories. Um, I think not, chron not in publication order, but chronologically. 
it's the second book in the series which is apparently the order that i'm reading these in um i do not like the witcher books oh how do i describe this he's a witcher which is essentially a person with some level of magic he's a mutant that's that's how they describe him he's kind of he's mostly human a little bit mutant and he hunts monsters and he uses like spells and stuff to do it um these books got really popular the other year because they had a new tv series coming out and they're really popular because of the games um the games are great these books are not great i don't like them i'm determined to read the first novel which is why i'm continuing on but i'm not a fan so this is just like short stories and he basically has a different monster to kill in each short story for the most part um not literally but like that's essentially what these are i don't understand why people like these i don't like the writing style first of all it's like mostly dialogue like the stories are mostly dialogue and then describing the actual fight scenes and that is like 95 percent of this book which is so boring i don't understand why anyone likes that it's not interesting to read it's not fun in any way it's just like conversations sword fighting the end um and then they're also just like horrifically sexist they're like potentially the most sexist things i've ever read every female character in these books is an object like none of the characters overall have any kind of character development male or female but at least the male characters are not objects every no female character in this book has any sort of agency is treated as anything other than an object and it's just like bad like they've introduced i think more than one character by describing her boobs and i was just like why why like i'm not even surprised anymore when like the majority of the characters in this book are like having threesomes and their existence in the book is to have a threesome with the main character like one of the short stories was just entirely about the main character and this wizard dude fighting over the love of this woman which like you ever thought about talking to her maybe I'm not a fan i am determined to get through the first novel and then i will probably dnf this series because after two books i can't imagine that it gets better the one person i know who likes these says they like them because of the games because they love the game so much and like have played through the games and they like the books because of that so that makes more sense to me and that's the only reason i can imagine why anyone would like these and then i read my one ebook for the month concrete rose by angie thomas this is a prequel for the hate you give it's about a teenage boy 17 year old named maverick who finds out he's the father of this girl's child um they had a one night stand he has a steady girlfriend and he just finds out he's a father and then very quickly he becomes a single father and at the same time he's also dealing with gang issues because his father was very big in a gang and is now in prison and he has also joined the gang in order to make money to like help support his family and his mother and now his son so the book is basically about him being a father his relationship with his steady girlfriend and also just finding out who he is and like if he's a member of the gang if that's what he's going to do with his life or if he's trying to get out of that world and it's it's really good um he's the father of the main character from the hate you give but that's kind of like not super relevant to the story like it's the kind of prequel where like you don't need to read the original first or like at all i mean i think you should because the hate you give is fantastic as well but like it works as a standalone because like it's not tied in any way important to the hate you give it's more just like oh it happens to be like overlapping characters but it works really well on its own too i gave it four stars it is fantastic i don't know how to talk about this book because it's just like good in every way you know like kind of similar to my thoughts on the hate you give like these are just really good books angie thomas is just like a really good writer how do you describe something that's just like every part of it is just really well done like the characters were great i loved hearing from matt's point of view he's 
very interesting like very complex like you understand where he's coming from even when he's making these poor decisions and it's really interesting all the surrounding cast was really interesting and really well done um i almost think it was better written than the hate you give like it just it makes me want to read her other book on the come up um haven't read that yet but definitely like at this point she's an auto read author for me like eventually i will get to all of her books as she publishes them um i don't keep up with things very well but she is fantastic if you've somehow managed to avoid reading her books i highly recommend them i haven't read on the come up yet but judging by these two that's probably also fantastic I don't I don't have a whole lot to say on this book but it was just like I was having a bad day I was very stressed I wanted to read something that was good and this was good and it was exactly what I wanted it to be so highly highly recommend then I read Ordinary Men Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland by Christopher R Browning this is a nonfiction book about the Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland <laughs> basically um this was a nazi group um not military technically they were reserve police which basically meant they were men who were too old to be in the military who were kind of sent through poland to kill jews like that was their purpose and they were responsible for the killings of thousands and thousands of jews like these were like the mass murderers in poland basically um really interesting concept i gave this three stars it's really interesting information like it, it really is i think it's very worthwhile i'm glad i read this but it is very dry christopher browning is an academic he's a professor at i think the university of north carolina chapel hill um and he writes like an academic so this book is very dry there's a lot of like facts and figures it's a lot of like this thousands this number of people were deported on this date from this location to that location by this person who was leading a force of this many men and it's just like so many numbers and dates and, not, and names and places that are just like mixing around in my head that like by the time i get to the end of the sentence i've like forgotten the information from the beginning um i don't do super well with like exact details like that I kind of like nonfiction that's more like the overall story so like I understand what was happening but like I'm not gonna remember each date each name each place you know I sort of want like more big picture stuff so I did struggle with this in that regard it was very dry um but it was very very worthwhile I'm so glad I read it like despite struggling with this I did really enjoy it my other kind of issue with it was how short it was for how much information was there it could have been kind of drawn out a little like a little bit i don't want to say padding but kind of like smoothing out the information you know would have would have helped it a lot it was only 189 pages of actual book and it it could have been like 250 if he like kind of smoothed it out and made it more narrative style than like information 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 and I think it would have been a lot easier to read, but I don't think that's what he was doing. I think that's just like what's easier for me. So I would recommend this if you're interested and you don't find something that's a little more academic focused. Um, like half of this book is just the notes and bibliography in the bag. And there was also an afterward, which I started reading and then wound up kind of skimming. That was kind of like the academic version of him having a cat fight with another professor who apparently disagreed with him which was somewhat amusing but not being in academia myself is sort of not super interesting but very worthwhile book i don't think i'll be keeping this for my shelf but i am glad i read it i'm glad i got to it i do think it was offered a lot of interesting information at the end of the day this was kind of an argument that any person not every single person but most people can be put in this situation and become mass killers it wasn't something like about these individual men that was like psychopathic or like down to murder people it was sort of like about their trauma like from committing the murders you know and how some of them actually refused to commit murder and 
were allowed to refuse and how so many of them like 80 to 90 percent of them did not refuse and kind of it just followed them and it was really interesting and horrifying um i think a lot of the time we're used to reading books about the holocaust from the point of view of the victims so it was like horrifying in a different way to read about the point of view of the perpetrators um but i would if you're interested and you're okay with academic stuff, I, I would recommend this. It was good. Then I picked up Karen Slaughter's new release, False Witness. I say new release, but this came out last year. So not not super new. This is about a girl, a girl, a woman. She's a lawyer who has a sister who is addicted to heroin. And she is defending a client for rape and then she realizes that she knew this client as a child she babysat for him and his father was a bad person who abused her sister and it kind of goes from there and you find out there's a lot of dark secrets and the man who's on trial for rape is kind of not a great guy either and sort of manipulating her and it's very scary and thrillery and grisly and just typical Karen Slaughter. I gave this four stars. I do think this is probably one of her best books. It's so well done. The characters in this are fantastic. Like I I love the characters, especially her younger sister Callie was really really well done. Um, I loved it. This is the only thriller that's ever made me cry. <laughs> Which I cry at pretty much anything and everything. I cried at Concrete Rose. I don't even mention when books make me cry all the time because like I do it so frequently that there's no, there's no point. But I don't cry at thrillers and this one made me cry. The ending was just like so sad, so touching, so like wonderful. Um, if you haven't read Karen Slaughter, I think this is a good place to start. I think it is less grisly than a lot of her books because she, she writes very brutal graphic thrillers um and I know that like that kind of thing is not super everyone's thing <laughs> but I think this one is less bad in that regard there's a lot more like humanity in the characters it feels more real it feels more like something that could happen it doesn't feel like as over the top and ridiculous and melodramatic it was just really really well done and the characters were so so good like I was crying at the end because like the characters just really touched me and there's this vet who's like one of my favorite characters he's just this old vet who has like early stages dementia and he works with Callie who's addicted to heroin and he knows and he doesn't judge her for it and like he's just so sweet and oh, it's it's lovely um there's also a lot of like brutal murders and rapes and everything but like Beyond that, it is still a lovely, wonderful book. Um, yeah, if you haven't read Karen Slaughter and you're you're looking for one to pick up, I think this is a really good place to start. The only thing I've really struggled with, well, I struggled with Lee's character a little bit. I was just kind of less interested in her. And I find this sometimes when books follow multiple characters, I'm a lot more interested in one of the characters than the other. And that kind of like brings the book down a little for me because it's like, I get bored during Lee's sections, not because she's a bad character, but just because Callie was so much more interesting. Um, and the other thing that I kind of struggled with was that this book is set during COVID. So like there's a lot of discussion of COVID and I just struggled with that a lot. Um, I don't think I like that. <laughs> Maybe it was the way it was handled here, but yeah, it was not, it was less enjoyable for that aspect for me. Um, not bad, but like, I did overall just really love this. Then I read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I read this for book sell it span book read along. Um, this was the June book. I have a very tiny copy so I feel like I need to hold it closer to the screen um, or closer to the lens. Um, this is a classic. It was published in the mid 1850s about a woman who has a married woman whose husband is still abroad in England she lives in Puritan New England in the 1640s. She has an affair and from that affair she gets pregnant and has a child and of course it's the Puritans so <laughs> lots of scandal. She's put in prison. There's talk of having her killed, hanged, um, 
and instead because of the child probably they decide her punishment is to live the rest of her life with the letter a for adulterer embroidered on her chest so this tells the story of her life as her daughter is growing up and just kind of who she had the affair with you know what happened to her husband and kind of like everything in the town um I gave this four stars I really enjoyed it I was a little bit on the fence between three and four stars and I think more the four star range if you disregard the introduction Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote it was very boring it was like 40 pages of worthless stuff that didn't really make full sense and then more to it's a three stars if you're like including that um if you started the, the scarlet letter as like a teen in school and decided you hated it and it was boring i recommend returning it and skipping the custom house because the custom house is just this long pointless 40 page introduction that has basically nothing to do with the story and the actual story was really interesting to me this is also one of those books that's like more commentary than narrative like there is a narrative the narrative matters but like the commentary kind of matters more so i understand why this is picked for school discussion a lot um i really enjoyed it i could probably talk about this book forever if i had someone to like go back and forth with it's like hard to review the way i review books because it's like interesting characters but it was like less about the characters than it was like let's discuss the society they lived in and the consequences of these actions and like what things meant you know this is kind of one of those books and it's hard for me to discuss that because that's not how I usually talk about books but I really really enjoyed it um I will probably read more Nathaniel Hawthorne but I'm glad I finally got to this and to be honest I thought I was gonna hate it and I didn't it was really good the only thing I did find myself thinking was that this book was awfully short it's like around the 200 page mark without the introduction which is kind of short for a novel and it just felt like a lot of the events in this book could have been elongated and probably made for better reading because of it like it is very slow but it also feels like you get like the bare minimum of the information and had it been like 100 pages longer maybe it could have been a lot more filled out like the characters could have had more depth um it just could have been more for me because i feel like this book was kind of like very brief for what it was doing and maybe like a little more time would have benefited it but still really enjoyed it and would highly recommend if you like a slower kind of I think it was described as like a psychological novel which is true um fascinating then I read Time is a Mother by Ocean Vong this is a poetry collection <laughs> it's his second poetry collection I was trying to branch out and read a bit of poetry and I struggled with this a lot. I decided to read this unrated, to leave this unrated, uh, which I don't do frequently. Um, but just like, I felt like I couldn't accurately review it, like, I, or not review it, read it. Like, not because it's like, oh, I didn't enjoy it and poetry is like very personal and subjective. Like, I could review, I could rate it subjectively, you know, like two stars for my enjoyment or four stars for my enjoyment. But it's like, I felt like I didn't understand it enough to be able to read it. Like even subjectively, it was like, I don't know what I read mostly. Like most of this book was over my head. It was just like, the words didn't like fit together for me. Um, I'd be very interested to read his novel and see what his prose is like. Cause there were some very interesting things in here. And one of the poems like, almost made me cry like genuinely like I was getting all teary-eyed at one of the poems because it was like very emotional and like some of the other poems also made me emotional like not as much as that one but like the majority of it kind of meant nothing to me it was just like random words that like didn't totally fit and I kind of struggled with it and I just think this is maybe like not my kind of thing like I don't know I wouldn't say don't read it like by any means because like even not loving it not understanding it there were still a couple poems that were really really wonderful and like one of them I was like oh my god that's like so emotionally painful like it, it really touched me like a few the few things that I understood really touched me which I feel like is what you want poetry to do I just wish I'd understood more of it but I am curious to see what his prose is like so I will probably be reading that um 
but if you like poetry I would say like I liked what I understood so perhaps you will as well I'd say what this is about but like it's supposed to be about like his grief after his mother's death and the few poems that hit me hard the main one that made me cry almost was about his mother's cancer but it felt like most of the book was not really about that um but maybe that's just me not really understanding what he was doing I don't know um just I think not for me or maybe like I just need to read more poetry I'm not a good poetry person and I'm I'm working on it but still struggling quite a bit and then the last thing I read was Green Suede Shoes by Larry Kerwin in Irish American Odyssey he is the lead singer of Black 47 which is a rock band um from the 90s the early 90s late 80s maybe even um this is his memoir he was born in Ireland in the 50s I think 54 and he moved to America New York in his late teens early 20s and then sort of was in the music industry for a very long time and then was in Black 47 as their lead singer and yeah the the book is his memoir it's about his life um I gave this two stars to be honest I went on a rating journey with this book I talked about this before but usually I know fairly early on what I'm going to rate books which is not to say I won't change my mind on that because I will but usually it's like 20 pages in I get the vibe of like what I know it's gonna be um 20 pages into this book I was like this is four stars this is fascinating it was a lot about like Irish politics and like really interesting stuff um just like the way he discussed politics and like growing up in Ireland and like his struggles with like Northern Ireland and like what that meant to him and like just his life and like his grandfather who was an Irish Republican and then who was excommunicated from the Catholic Church for it and then he was like further left than his grandfather because that was the only way he could like be more radical than him and really really interesting stuff and then you kind of got to the middle section of the book that was a lot about like the music industry and the scene in New York and I was kind of like huh I don't have a whole lot of interest in that I like the Irish politics more so it was falling towards like three star range and then it was a lot about him touring with Black 47 and what being in Black 47 was like and I was like maybe I should just leave this unrated because I'm not a fan of Black 47 <laughs> um which I don't know why I picked up this book in that case but um yeah I was like this is not for me I'm not a fan so maybe I should leave it unrated and then you got to the end and he ended this book with like this weird essay well there was some emotional family stuff towards the end that I really liked but he ended it with this weird like very judgmental essay that was very much felt like him sitting there like shaking his cane being like kids these days um and he talked about how like he wouldn't become a musician today because today music is a non-essential luxury like actually the words he used and then he talked about how like television was like destroying the world kind of and like it was a lot of like <laughs> very weird very judgmental things where I was like I am oh this has changed my opinion of basically everything he said um so yeah I just calling music a non-essential luxury is a bold statement for a musician and it was just like annoying and kind of he had that judgmental tone throughout the book where like he complained a lot about MTV and he called it MTV like E-M-P-T-Y-V um which was like a little bit too kitschy and just like trying too hard and just like he complained about like pop music not meaning anything and like I don't know it was a lot of just like weird judgy things like you can be into rock and be a rock musician and like not also be super judgmental of like anything that's not you and that is not into you and then one thing that really annoyed me he went on for a long section complaining about um, his label because his label basically like wrecked their first album or second album or something and then like cut them off and like he complained about that and discussed it a lot and I was like okay valid boring to me but valid and then, like a few chapters later he was like I'm not one to complain about record labels and I was like my dude you just spent like 50 pages complaining about the label you had like why are you lying or trying to pretend like you're different like it just 
I don't know. I was so annoyed at the end. I was like, this is two stars. Like, I just, mm -mm, no. <laughs> so, yeah, this, this didn't impress me. If you're really into Black 47, I'd recommend it, maybe. Um, if you want to know more about him, like, sure. But, yeah, I'm not. I mean, I am now, because he included songs in this book, so I was listening to a lot of the music as I was reading. And, like, I kind of like a lot of his music. Like, not my favorite thing in the world, but definitely, like, interesting music that I want to hear more of. So, I think from now I'm gonna, like, stick with the music and maybe, like, disregard the writing. So, I don't know. Just not for me, and I wasn't really impressed with a lot of his views. So, that was all ten books that I read in the month of June. Um... From my TBR and everything I checked out of the library, I read everything except for one book, which was one of the seven books that I originally put on my TBR. So that is amazing. I read all the library books I checked out and six of the seven books from my TBR. Like 10 out of 10, that is more than I ever would have expected from myself. So I'm stoked with June um, and I'm stoked that I had a five star read and that I love the Karen Slaughter book so much. It's always a good month when I love at least two of the books. Let me know down below if you've read any of these books and what your thoughts were if you have. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see y'all again soon.